Mark, thanks for coming and talking to me today. I always enjoy your conversations, as you know. So um, I think that you're well situated to speak to the intersection of politics and technology right now. Um, politics is very faction intense, as everybody is aware. It seems like nobody is happy with the political arena at the moment. Um, but as an integrated thinker who's on the edge of working on decentralized technologies, can you speak a little bit to what you think, how you think technology is reflecting the political atmosphere today? Yes. So 10 years ago, you saw the rise of Twitter, Facebook, and everybody got onto those platforms. Those platforms are fundamentally centralized. Mm -hmm. If Twitter is not working, then you can't use Twitter. And they're walled gardens. Facebook and Twitter eventually decided they didn't really want to share any of the information amongst each mm. other because that data represents what they can resell to advertisers and make profit. Um, it took a while for Twitter to eventually turn off their their what's called the fire hose, but you always had to be logged into Facebook in order to see your what, friends. What was the fire data. hose? The fire hose was, in, was for programmers a way to access every single tweet coming out of Twitter um, on another website. Oh, like a, like a scraper or something? Yeah. Okay. Well, except for Twitter provided it. Okay. Then you had the emergence of Uber and Airbnb. And then that's interesting because everybody had to get onto their platform, right? But they didn't actually run or control any of the services on the platform compared to taxi cabs, compared to hotels. They didn't own any of that. So they get people on their platform, but then they are staying in a house not owned by Airbnb. They're, staying, they're getting in a car not owned by Uber. It's okay. fundamentally outside of Uber's control unless Uber you know, decides. Okay, so it's like decentralized distribution channels. Well, it's a centralized distribution channel, but the actual service is okay. decentralized. Yeah, sure, sure. Right? Yeah, and, and that, that's interesting. And, and we're seeing a trend, especially in the world that I operate in, that like, hey, what if we can actually do the same thing, but eliminate Uber as a middleman altogether? So, okay, so you're talking about, taking the example of Uber, you're talking about me hailing a ride, but... I'm not, like, Uber isn't acting as a middleman that scrapes off the top in these transactions. Yeah. Okay, so how, how on earth would such a system work? There is this movement that's been going on for a really long time called the mm -hmm. open source um, movement. And it's primarily for programmers, but mm -hmm. it, it is a concept that should apply to everything. So back yeah. in the early 1990s... It sounds like you're banking on somebody doing free labor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. At least up front. As we're doing a lot of free labor and giving away all the software <laughs> we write for free. Um, there is this little thing called Linux. <laughs> most people use Windows, most people use uh, Mac, but there is the open source operating system called Linux that started mm -hmm. in the 90s. I think open source was, was before that. But, but point being is open source has grown into this very large movement inside of the tech community. We're also hoping to see that inside of academics that, you know, with the emergence of the internet and everybody being on the internet, that information should be free. I should have free access to Wikipedia. Like, you could think of Wikipedia almost as being open source. So to tie it back in with Uber, right, there might be a company or an individual or a nonprofit that does the free labor of writing the app mm -hmm. that everybody can download. But once everybody's downloaded the app, you're not having to get on Twitter in order to use the platform. In fact, once you've downloaded the app, the app is just going to connect with other people um, within your city. Okay. And it might be using underneath, that the consumer isn't aware, three servers, 50 servers, or no servers. It might literally be connecting straight to the driver that, you're, that you want to get a ride from. And... Even if the whole rest of the world were to um, go up in flames, uh, ideally it doesn't, although politics is pushing in that direction, um, you and your driver would, be, would have a direct connection. And you'd still be connected, even if Twitter failed or so how, Wikipedia failed. Or... How, I, I have a couple of questions that come to mind. The first one is, how do people, or companies rather, make money in this type of a paradigm um, and become profitable, or do they just not? And the idea is, all right, we see the labor market shifting anyway, and jobs become sort of these micro tasks 
like TaskRabbit and, and so on. But, you know, the, the Uber driver, driver is getting paid. Uber is not. Correct. So which, which direction? Is there a way to monetize that as an entity? Or is this leading to some, you know, utopic future where there is no entity? I think it could be boiled down to three things. So the first one that you said is there is a nonprofit or an individual or a company that sponsors writing the app and gives it away for free, mm -hmm. but itself doesn't make any profit. Um, so it largely probably be a nonprofit or an individual who's trying to contribute to that. The or second, maybe like a complimentary service to something that promotes a less free product? No? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> There's lots of companies that won't like that. But the second one is just because you're using the app and it might be free doesn't mean that you aren't going to pay other people to, for the actual getting driven around for the actual right. service. Right. And you could argue that the company who wrote the app could take a royalty on that, but the issue is what Uber already does. Right. If the app is free and open source, somebody can just fork the code and remove uh, the royalty. Um, and in economics, it is inevitable, right, that the cheapest, highest quality service is going to win out. So if it's trivial to remove the middleman, the middleman will always be removed. But I actually foresee, well, okay, before we get into further economics, um, on, on that second piece, I, I do see, and I don't like this, I do see some level of sponsorship possibly happening. That mm -hmm. let's say I'm not paying the driver or let's say I am paying the driver. Maybe the app is sponsored by Coca-Cola um, and that might fund the app development. Mm -hmm. Again, that moves towards advertising. Advertising is perfectly possible in a decentralized world, but a lot of people who are trying to move away from centralization into blockchain or crypto or into decentralization um, are trying to move away from the privacy scandals, even though um, at the end of the day, a lot of consumers don't um, make choices based off of that. It, so it's still perfectly possible to do advertising in a decentralized world, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, ideally we don't. The third and more interesting one is actually rewriting all of economics itself and saying, hey, <laughs> we used to have this thing called capitalism where in order to get a chair, I had to give you something else in exchange because uh, building a chair takes a lot of lumber and wood and that's a finite resource. It's a scarce resource. So in order for me to get the chair, I had to give you another finite or scarce resource. But as soon as we've entered into the digital era, the internet, right? Uh, that movie that you might be pirating or paying for legally, that song that you might be hearing on Spotify or on the radio that's just getting broadcast to you, you can take that information and replicate it millions, trillions of times at basically zero cost. There's no further capital once the movie or the song or the article or the blog is produced to, yeah. to copy, unlike a chair. Right. Every new chair, sure. I have to make a new chair. So then the question is, okay. These digital goods are still marked up 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you think about the largest companies in the world right now, Apple, Google, Facebook, um, Microsoft, most of their, especially in Google's case, they're making a ton of profit off of digital goods that are not scarce. Yeah. So if if a large portion of the capitalist economy is running off of non-scarce resources, yet the very word of capitalism means capital in the sense of zero sum, why not start introducing ideas that don't require um, capital in the money, in the currency? Okay. So that's really interesting. And reining this back into the political realm... I mean, are, what do you think is going on? I know that there are a lot of tensions in, um, in the tech world right now about privacy and security. And, you know, we hear lots of people getting really angry at Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but they're still using Facebook. Um, and then there's, you know, the call for decentralized Facebook coming around to sort of get rid of these privacy problems. Um, but... I know that it has been a struggle for decentralized apps to figure out how to make money in the first place to keep alive um, and fund them themselves. So what, I, I guess I just am wanting to pull this back into politics, like who do you see, what companies do you see aligning themselves with which political agendas and why might that be? 
Ooh, that is a dangerous question. <laughs> um, I'm going to slowly answer it. I'm going to step dangerous back is first. Good. Dangerous is good. And then we just have a few minutes left and we'll have okay. to wrap up. But That sounds good. So stepping back, first of all, I want to make the statement that nobody is teaching people to dream anymore. So politics used to have that type of hope in it. But now it's just a bunch of, um, and it's been this way for a long time, but it, it's escalated more and more that it's really about hyping up hate. So I think people were interested in tech because you could have a nobody, right, start a company and that company suddenly get adopted by billions of people and you have the, these incredible exits. So that represented the American dream. That previously the American dream was with respect to politics, now it's with respect to technology. But now, <laughs> that has kind of gone away too. Hollywood had that at some point too, right? You could be a nobody and then suddenly become a celebrity. But now tech is just trying to sell user souls for profit. Hollywood is just trying to squeeze a sequel out to get money out of your wallet. Yeah. And politics trying to hype up hate. So nobody wants you to dream anymore. So I think there is a very important opportunity to come into politics and to technology and to economics and to entertainment and say, hey world, dream. So I think at a political, economic, technological level, that is a very, very important first level thing to say. And, and now we can start talking about capitalism and socialism, the right versus left. <clears throat> they seem polarizing, they seem different. But I'm going to say that they're all the same, okay? They're all trying to drive this echo chamber of a narrative that drives polarization to get people to think based off of their emotions, not off of rational discourse, open conversation, or mm -hmm. civility. And guess what? Whether that be voting power or whether that be getting people to purchase a product, if you can get people to think off of emotions and make decisions off of emotion, you can make a whole lot more money in capitalism. And in politics, you can get a whole lot more voting power. So while I think both sides have their individual arguments that the left is saying, you know, the right is just capitalist pigs making a lot of money and the right is saying that the, you know, making the claim that the left is just exploiting a bunch of minorities to get, you know, everybody to, to vote for their political agenda, but not actually delivering on any promises. Both sides have a narrative that's hard to understand if you're from the other camp, but has obviously created a large audience. Mm -hmm. But they're selling the same muckraking. They're selling the same emotions. Okay. So I want to ask you just one more pointed question, and um, I'm going to have to hurry you along because we only have a few minutes left. Okay. But um, is it unfair to suggest that a company that's structured in this fully centralized manner, like Facebook and Google, are going to have a different political preference than a company that's structured more like Airbnb or Uber versus companies that are decentralized fully, um, something like Not a Bug mm -hmm. or DTube? Um, and, and, you know, these apps are starting to gain quite a big unique user base each month. And so the, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, what, what sort of political preference is drawing users into each of these, yeah. these apps? So it's a fact that Google funded, well, I shouldn't say Google, but Eric Schmidt, who's affiliated mm -hmm. with Google, mm -hmm. funded, uh, the Democrat campaign. And of course, it's a fact that you know, a lot of oil, um, uh, people who have money behind oil have funded the right. So there's certainly political agendas that exist from capitalist side, whether left-leaning capitalist or right-leaning capitalist, or I should say wealthy left or wealthy right towards politics. Um, but there's no question that any centralized company, whether it be Facebook or Google or even Uber, has an agenda once they've established their monopoly to use capitalism and socialism, to use regulatory power for the government and their uh, market advantage mm -hmm. that they exploit that. So a lot of people think, oh, like Uber, Google, Facebook, they're so big we now need the government to regulate them. But oftentimes what happens is 
underneath Facebook and Google are getting regulations to be passed on social networking sites in general. So they don't specifically apply to Facebook, they apply to social networking sites in general. But once you then have laws passed that social networking sites have to do X, Y, Z regulation, it actually then prevents um, new, oh. new social networking startups from trying to get off the ground because let's say before they can even allow people to register, right. they have to have um, you know, paid the government, some okay, X yeah, fee yeah, or something of course. like that, right? So does that go away for a structure that's more like Airbnb or Uber? It seems like not. No, but this is the interesting with scoff law, right? Like Uber basically violated the law, mm -hmm. did it fast enough, hard enough to get a whole large user base. And now that they have killed off the taxi industry, they're now starting to say, oh, okay, we'll start paying the medallions. We'll start paying the government. But that now has just locked Uber into being now the monopoly not the taxis. Mm -hmm. So they're both using market forces of capitalism and the regulatory mm -hmm. um, forces to maintain their monopoly. Mm -hmm. So it goes both ways. Now, if we were to take an open source version of Uber that connects you peer to peer, if that was suddenly to grow a large audience really quickly, but now the government has um, uh, you know, smack down and lock down things because of Uber, that's actually going to prevent the truly open source and community driven Uber from competing against Uber because mm -hmm. now that community driven Uber is going to have to pay um, the same fines that Uber is, which is going to, let's say, be more. Well, than if before. I mean, is there a way to regulate that though? Because if there is no Uber to go and try to tax heavily because they failed some regulation, what, what are they going to do, you know? If everybody's going down the freeway 80 miles per hour, who gets the ticket? I, um, is it regulatable? Or are you saying, yeah, because somebody has to maintain this app? Is the government going to regulate or is the app going to ensure that people don't get I guess I'm hurt? saying even if the government wanted to regulate decentralized Ubers out of existence, is that possible? Is that feasible for them? That's going to be a whole another long conversation. Maybe we should yeah. save okay, for it. Okay, you're right. We should, <laughs> we should wrap up today. Um, thank you for joining me, and we're, we're going to have to have you back soon and talk about some more of these ideas. So okay. thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for having me on the show.